Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream for History Value Podcast. Today, I am joined by Dr. Lawrence Cross. Welcome to History Value Podcast, Dr. Cross. Hi, how are you doing? Nice Pretty well, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I said, uh, I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, God. Sorry, I can hear you now. It was a glitch. Okay, I'm. Uh, it's fine. It's a nice, cold, but uh, but enjoyable day here. For those that do not know, uh, Dr. Lawrence Cross is an uh, internationally known theoretical physicist and best-selling author, as well as being an acclaimed lecturer. He has also appeared regularly on radio and television, as well uh, as in several feature films. He was born in New York City and moved shortly thereafter to Toronto, Canada, where he grew up. He received undergraduate degrees in both mathematics and physics at Carleton University. He received his PhD in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1982. He then joined the Harvard Society of Fellows from 1982 to 85. He then joined the faculty of the Departments of Physics and Astronomy at Yale University as assistant professor in 1985 and associate professor in 1988. From 1993 to 2008, he was Ambrose Swayze, professor of physics, professor of astronomy at Case Western Reserve University. From 1993 to 2005, he also served as chair of the physics department there. During this period, he built up the department, which was ranked among the top 20 physics graduate research programs in the country. In a 2005 national ranking, among the major new initiatives he spearheaded were the creation of one of the leading particle astrophysics experimental and theoretical programs in the US, the Center for Education and Research in Cosmology and Astrophysics, and the creation of a groundbreaking master's program in physics entrepreneurship. Among his numerous important scientific contributions was a proposal in 1995 that most of the energy of the universe was created in empty space. This prediction was verified in 1999 by two teams of astronomers, and the discovery was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2011. In 2008, he was appointed as foundation professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and Physics Department, and inaugural director of the Origins Project at Arizona State University. During the decade 2008 to 2018, in which he led the program, the Origins Project became internationally recognized through his renowned transdisciplinary workshops and been bringing this exciting information to the public through its public events, bringing the most accomplished scholars, public intellectuals, and celebrities in the world on stage at ASU to discuss topics ranging from the origins of the universe to human origins, the origins of consciousness and culture. In 2019, he became president of the Origins Project Foundation, an independent nonprofit organization that carries on the mission of inspiring the wonder and excitement of knowledge, inquiry, and creativity in new forms for the public. In 2019, he also became host of the Origins Podcast. All right, once again, uh, welcome to History by Dr. Cross. Well, nice to, nice to hear you. That was a long and probably the longest introduction I've had in a while, but comprehensive. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's get right into it. Um, I love the title of your book, A Universe from Nothing. I think it's quite fitting. And since, uh, especially since like a lot of, a lot of apologists will say that atheists think the universe, they'll, they'll make fun of atheists saying, oh, they think the universe came from nothing. And that, that makes no sense. So where do you think the material that makes up the universe came from? Because I know that the common response to that is, well, it's a, they're misunderstanding it. It's not, it's not necessarily that it came from nothing. So, um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I write my thoughts are basically in in the book, but uh, the um, uh, as I point out, they all they literally all could have arisen out of from nothing. There could the whole point is that there need not have been a universe. There need not to have been a space and a time, um, uh, and that space and time themselves can spontaneously appear due to the laws of quantum mechanics and presumably quantum gravity. Um, and that, moreover, you can actually start with such a universe, you can create such a universe, uh, such a universe can arise spontaneously and have no matter in it. But then again, uh, depending upon the initial conditions and, and or more importantly, the evolution of the universe, that em- seemingly empty space can fill up with stuff by a variety of processes, including um, including the possibility of, of what's called inflation. And, uh, and so all of the stuff we see, all 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars, can literally have come out of nothing in the sense that there was absolutely nothing, no space, no time, no matter radiation. And once space was created, then it's still possible to create lots of matter in space without violating any laws of energy, conservation, or anything else. So, uh, so 
literally, um, literally, as I say, it came from nothing. And I, I, meant, I meant what I said. All right, we got a super chat from Constellation Pegasus. Thank you for your super chat. When will the data from the web let us know the composition of Arundel? It's exciting. We have imaged one of the first stars to form. Well, look, uh, we just I just ran an event uh, last week on the on uh, with three four of the most well known cosmologists in the world. One of whom was John Mather, and he's was one of the leading scientists leading the development of the JWST, the design and development teams. And uh, and he was pointing out that new information is coming along every week. Uh, there was a, a, a new new image that he showed of a star forming region, and uh, we won't. The James Webb Space Telescope won't allow us to particularly image the details of stars, but it'll allow us to look at the what I find even more exciting the the um, the uh, it'll allow us to see the existence of stars and in fact the first stars and galaxies. That's what it's really designed to do by looking at the infrared radiation instead of visible radiation and using something called gravitational lensing to magnify even more distant objects. So. The, the key thing is it'll be able to look more at the nature of galaxies than early stars um, to try and understand the evolution of galaxies. But we don't really understand how they evolved necessarily. In particular, how did the supermassive black holes inside the center of galaxies arise? Um, but I, I still find in terms of imaging things, what I find even more exciting is the likelihood of at least spectroscopically imaging the, the atmosphere of distant planets to look for perhaps signs of life. But the great thing about the James Webb Space Telescope is that it's operating and producing images faster than I ever expected. And every week, it seems there's a new image. I, I, I'll go on. In terms, of, in, terms of the, in terms of the most distant stars, in order to know the composition of stars, you have to be able to take a very good spectrum of them. And, and for the most distant objects, I think that the likelihood of getting a very good spectrum will be difficult at best. And if it's certainly for individual stars, it will be. Um, the spectral nature of distant galaxies uh, will be more interesting because one has blue light from, you know, the early, earliest energetic period of stars. But but to understand when, when first generation, second generation, and so on, stars formed, you look at the overall spectrum of the galaxies in question, and that'll be very interesting to see. Are there... Um... Are there multiple different causes that could cause something to like come from uh, come from nothing, or is it is it? Well, there's uh, no causes. I don't no want to think of causes in that sense. Right. Quantum mechanics things can spontaneously arise as long as the conditions allow, and uh, and that's what could happen with, with the universe. So it's really the the possibility is due to the laws of quantum mechanics and due to the presumed nature of quantum gravity. Quantum gravity is a theory of space and time. Those are the variables, if you wish, of, of uh, uh, the dynamical variables, space and time, um, that, that, and, and, and the geometry of space and time, which is really the dynamical variable. And in quantum mechanics, those variables become quantum objects. And, and, as, and when you allow relativity, they can spontaneously uh, appear. So it's really just, it's, there's no cause any more than there's a cause to the, to the elect electrons in the light that's to my right here um, uh, uh, suddenly uh, uh, emitting a photon uh, when they're excited uh, it's bound to happen the probabilities are that there will be many photons doing that but each 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 atom that does it does d emits light spontaneously some people have been going around and saying that the James Webb telescope somehow, refutes the big bang um yeah. what do you think about that well i asked that question even though i knew what the answer was it was asked by one of the audience members at the event we did on wednesday and that event by the way will eventually be aired uh on our on our uh, both our youtube channel and our substack sub site our podcast site um and 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 um and John Mather said he, it's complete nonsense. It hasn't refuted the Big Bang as it, as I knew it hadn't. And he said that he was there was he had no idea what the what the claimed evidence was. So that uh, that rumor that's going around is false. So I want to talk about the uh, 
yeah, a, a little bit more on the Big Bang for a moment. Um, some some people will say that, um, like some people that don't understand uh, the Big Bang will claim that okay, so a a god or some intelligent being must have caused it. Mm -hmm. um, what what do you what are your thoughts on the inception of the Big Bang? And I, I think there are, if I remember correctly, there are some different theories about what may have uh, happened there. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, on the Big Bang, you say? Yes. Well, I mean, we we don't have a we don't know the laws of physics at t equals zero. Uh, that requires us to have a full theory of quantum gravity. But what really we have discovered, uh, it, likely, and by discovered I mean it's theoretically likely, we haven't yet got definitive evidence, um, is the fact that however the initial development of our universe, which could have been the spontaneous emergence of space and time, happened, shortly thereafter, there can be a period of, of, of rapid expansion due to the properties of... Uh, particles and fields, that's been called inflation. And as Alan Guth, who was also at our event um, the other night and was the sort of father in inflation, has pointed out that's the bang that really makes the big bang because, because whatever happens early on, if there's a period of inflation, the universe will spontaneously puff up to a great size. And then later on, it, 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 when, it, when that period ends, it releases that latent energy in terms of matter and radiation. So it's really what you think of as the bang of the big bang, the actual uh, emergence of our universe may not have involved the bang at all. But again, we cannot get back to T equals zero because we do not yet know the laws of physics at that time. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a, a little bit about the, uh, about that uh, paper that you said that was a heretical paper at the time that you wrote, that you wrote uh, um, with Michael Turner? The, the the paper arguing that there was dark energy that I wrote with Michael Turner, that one? Yes. Well, what we what actually what I did at the time looked at all of the data uh, from astronomy and it looked like it wasn't consistent with the picture that we theorists like to have, which was of a flat universe, one that with that had critical density to be exactly flat, uh, full of dark matter, which was the con conventional sort of preferred uh, in picture, a theoretical picture of the universe. We knew there was lots of dark matter and we, and there was uh, um, compelling evidence that the universe was flat um, uh, from, from the cosmic microwave background explorer satellite. But, but looking at, at the age of the universe and the amount of matter in the universe, the amount of visible matter in the universe, the amount of dark matter that was conferred on clusters, it looked like it was, all, it was not consistent with that preferred picture of a flat universe full of matter. And uh, in fact, the, when we looked at all these things, including age, we, we uh, l looked at and I argued that, in fact, it was consistent instead with a flat universe in which the dominant energy resided in empty space, something we'd like to call a cosmological constant. And we proposed that and we actually said it, all, it looks consistent with a universe which is seven, more or less 70 percent cosmological constant, 30 percent dark matter with a little sprinkling of normal matter in between. And I must admit the possibility that empty space had energy while I'd been exploring it for some time was nevertheless still so, so um, uh, remarkable or so difficult to understand that, that I wasn't wedded to that. What I really thought at the time was probably some of the data is wrong. And I want to point out that if the data is what it is, then, um, then maybe, maybe, maybe we have to revise some of the data if we want to get a consistent answer. Uh, but if all the data is right, this is where it's drawn to. And so it was really a heretical paper trying to point out the problems at the at the time and suggest some possible uh, areas where people should look at. When I made the when I when we wrote the paper, I, I lectured about it extensively. And I remember lecturing at a Lawrence Berkeley lab where Saul Permuter is an observer looking at supernovas. And I remember him saying, we will prove you wrong because we're going to try and measure the expansion rate of the universe. And and in the end, he proved us exactly right because it turned out it turned out that the data had been right, and our our conclusion that the that the universe must have seventy percent more or less dark energy turned out to be bang on with what was measured. So I was as surprised as anyone else at the time. Um, 
but uh, it, uh, it it was it's a weird feeling to have um, to to sort of think for the first time something so crazy and then find out the universe actually actually behaves that way. So the um, so there is energy in empty space. The dominant energy in the universe resides in empty space, and Saul and and then an independent team, um, Brian Schmidt and and Adam Reese and many others uh, also saw the same thing, and 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 saw Brian and Adam uh, won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. Could you uh, explain a little bit of, of what you mean by uh, nothing is unstable? Well, what I mean is that pure nothing, it, it, it all comes from the fact that basically the distinction between nothing and something in quantum mechanics is not, um, uh, is not, is not what uh, you'd imagine in, um, in, the in the classical world. Nothing and something are very distinct in, in, in those two worlds. But once you allow for quantum mechanics, nothing can become something, and in particular, empty space which you think is sort of the per prototype for nothing is really not empty. It's, it's empty. If you try and measure anything in it, you won't see anything, but it's, but we know that there are virtual processes, processes that are taking place on time scales and space scales. So, so small that you can't possibly measure them given the laws of quantum mechanics, that there's all sorts of stuff going on. It's changing the behavior of atoms. It's responsible for the mass of protons. And so we know that nothing is really not that distinct from something because there's particles, there's a boiling brew of particles, you know, emerging from nothing, virtual particles all the time. And under certain conditions, those virtual particles can actually turn into real particles and be measured. So if you wait long enough, in some sense, empty space will, one way or another, start burping out particles. And so uh, that's what I mean by nothing is something, is, is unstable. I mean, nothing is unstable. Can you tell us a bit about Einstein's God? I noticed that in, in the book you, talk, you you say that there's differences between Einstein's understanding of God and the biblical God. Well, Einstein used the word God a lot. It's unfortunate because people think he believed in it, but he made it quite clear he certainly didn't believe in a God, uh, anything like the scriptures. He um, he uh, he as people say, if anything, he believed in Spinoza's God, which is really more a sense of awe and wonder. That the universe is comprehensible, but he never believed in a personal creator or a deity or anything like that. In fact, he made fun of those fairy tales. But he used the word God, and all these people like to like to therefore um, argue that Einstein believed in God, but he certainly didn't believe in the God of the Bible. That's for sure. What what um what makes people think? What makes some people think that Einstein believed in the God in the first place? I, I remember hearing about that a while back, that most people think that he believes in the God, but it's contrary to what I knew about him. Like, mm. Well, I, I think the reason is that um, uh, because he used the word God a lot. Um, I think that's the point. He used the word God uh, and as, as a, you know, just as a convenient term. Uh, to, and, 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 and because he used it, people think he's... Think, that he meant by the God, the God that they happen to believe in. And that's not what he meant. So it's Einstein's fault for not being precise, but, you know, he's allowed to say whatever he wants, I guess. And certainly now can't defend it because he's dead. I'd like to return to the Big Bang topic for a moment. Um, what do you think about these long-winded apologetical arguments that some, that some people make, like the Kalam cosmological argument or arguments like it? They, they well, try to... They're, they're, I've had to debate this kind of stuff ad nauseum. And the point is, what they are, they're created by people who think they know the answer and they want to ask the questions afterwards. They, they know God created the universe and therefore they have to interpret everything they see in terms of that firmly held belief. And it's based on a kind of classical kind of thinking that makes no sense in a quantum mechanical world. So it's based on philosophical arguments that are really based on a, on, a, on a classical picture, and the world isn't classical. So one doesn't even have to waste time on them. Well, thanks for joining me today, Dr. Cross. Well, it's been, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, and I hope, I hope it's been a little bit illuminating and not too... Uh, I haven't confused oh, you. I, oh, I think it definitely uh, was illuminating, and, and especially to my audience and, and others that don't know this topic very well.
Thanks again. Okay, it's a pleasure. You take care. Keep up the good work. You too. Thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.